All right, good evening, everybody. We are meeting with Heather Darcy Bandari this evening, and she's an expert's expert. She's written a book, or she's co authored a book titled Art Work. And she knows the subject inside out, and it's a pleasure to have her with us tonight. Heather, I've got a bunch of questions, many of which I you know, ask people typically. Where were you raised? Uh, Rhode Island. Did you think you were an artist when you were a kid, or did your interest in art come later? Uh, oh, these are good questions. I don't, I'm not usually ask these questions. Um, I, uh, it came later. It definitely wasn't when I was a kid. When I was in high school, I think that's when I had uh, teachers who encouraged me um, a lot more, and I figured out my interest was definitely in art. So when I was applying to college, I was applying to art schools and liberal arts colleges, so I wasn't exactly sure. And what did and you actually, do? Yeah. What did you do for college? Um, I ended up going to Brown University because it was right next door to RISD. I couldn't fully commit to RISD at the time. And so um, that's actually pretty telling when you look back because I, I didn't consider myself 100% to be an artist. And so when I went to college, I was um, getting a really good liberal arts education, taking classes at Rhode Island School of Design. And then by the time you, I was, you, yeah. you took classes at RISD because I know at Brown and RISD you can go back and forth. You can take classes for credit at either school, right? Yeah, you can. And now they actually have a dual degree program. So now in five years you can get a BFA at RISD and a BA at Brown. So were you taking studio classes at RISD or were you taking art history classes or both? Studio classes. Studio. And then, yeah, and then I went straight to my MFA after because by the time I was finishing college, then I thought, okay, now I'm ready to commit to being an artist, and um, I got an MFA in painting. Yeah. Where, I'm sorry, say that again. Where was that? I got an MFA in painting at Penn State University. At Penn State. And, and then yeah. what did you do with that degree and that knowledge and that fabulous ability? <laughs> I decided not to make art anymore, <laughs> um, but that came a little bit later. So I chose Penn State because they offered teaching um, from the time you got there for your MFA. You could teach drawing classes, and I thought that would be a really good skill to have, to potentially teach. Um, and also, I didn't have any debt if I went there for grad school, which I thought was also a major consideration, um, since I already had so much debt from undergrad. So um, that's what I did, and I loved it. Painted all the time. I was in the middle of nowhere, so that's all I was doing. Um, and when I graduated, I had a couple of different intentions. One was to move to New York immediately, only because my world was small, not because I thought um, New York was the only place to be. It was because I had grown up in New England. I was on the East Coast. I didn't really know what was going on in the rest of the country, and especially the rest of the world. Um, and so I went to New York. Um, started working in my studio, and my day job ended up being working in a gallery. And so that's when my eyes were sort of open to the other possibilities for someone who was interested in making art, but also really interested in being in other people's studios and helping other people make their okay. art. So. How long ago was that? When did you move to New York? In 99. Okay. And... Interesting. And what, was that mixed greens? Was mixed greens around then? It was just starting, actually, but that's not where I worked originally. So okay. I started working at Sonnebend Gallery first, which was so exciting for me because um, that's where I got to actually start meeting people who I had only read about art history books or heard about in classes. Um, Fortunate, because of all, of all the galleries, I mean, you know, there you had artists who were in history books which, you know, most galleries anywhere don't have those. So that's pretty no. cool. No, it was really exciting. And we were getting faxes from Jeff Coons and things like that. I just thought it was all very exciting. Um, however, I ended up switching pretty quickly to Lehman Maupin Gallery, which at the time was more of an emerging program. They were much younger at the time. Now they're pretty blue chip gallery. But they were dealing with some people who were emerging artists at, the, at that time. And uh, I found that to be much more interesting, even though I was enamored by the familiar faces and the more art historical figures, I found it to be much more exciting to be in artist studios where you were actually helping to problem solve and get things made. 
a lot of those is other. That, is, that a lot of, is that a lot of what that your decision was, your choice rather to move from one to the other? Do you think yeah. that you got to be more hands on with more emerging artists? Yeah, that was part of the decision. So um, I did that, and then I moved from Lehman Muffin to Mixed Greens. It was a very, very conscious decision to move from Lehman Muffin to Mixed Greens because Mixed Greens was offering a totally different possibility. Um, at the time, Mixed Greens wasn't a traditional gallery. We didn't have a bricks and mortar space aside from the offices. So it was conceived of as an online entity. So, um, and as a resource for emerging artists. So not only were they dedicated entirely to emerging artists, but they were also using technology in a really different way, which I found to be totally thrilling. <laughs> um, and now it all seems really basic and really boring. But at the time, um, the woman who founded Mixed Greens, her name is Paige West, she thought of putting artists online. And at the time, the ArtNet existed and a few other online entities existed, but nothing like what she was envisioning, so which when, when, was... When was this and working with Mixed Greens? Um, in, in late 2000. Okay. So all of this other stuff happened within a year and a half. And then I went to Mixed Greens in 2000, and I've been there ever since. So it's been... And what was your position when you began there? Um, I can't remember exactly what I was called, but it was some sort of an artist manager, actually. So she conceived of this online entity as being a place where people could learn about artists um, in the privacy of their own home at 2 a.m. in their underwear, and you could see artist statements, you could look at, um, at artwork online, you could ask questions without feeling intimidated by a huge um, gallery desk where you couldn't even see the person over it. Um, and also, she saw Mixed Greens as a place where we would be working to be an art and, and manager or an agent, in a way, to these artists, because her brother actually worked in film, and she knew a lot of musicians, and she knew all of them had agents and managers, or someone writing a book has an agent that's helping them sort of navigate, and the visual artists that she was meeting didn't have any of this, and they still don't. Um, the funny part of all of this is I moved to Mixed Greens because it was such a different model. It was so incredibly wildly different than what anyone else was talking about. It was transparent. It was democratizing the art world. It was revolutionary to me. Um, but after a few years of doing that, we got all the artists together that we were working with. We were working with about 32-ish artists at the time. We got them together and we said, okay. We've been dealing with all your short-term goals and all these different ma manager sort of agent issues. Um, what do you guys want as a group? What do you want as long-term goals? And they said, could you be a traditional gallery like everyone else and give us solo exhibitions every two years? So it became very obvious that while we were doing traveling exhibitions and doing all this stuff online, the artist's real need was to, or the, the need they thought they had, it was most important at the time, was to actually have a bricks and mortar space. So we sort of did the opposite of what a lot of other galleries have done, where we started virtually and then ended up doing a sort of more of a hybrid. Um, galleries at the time thought that having uh, your artwork online was really awful and really gauche and really tacky, and it was never going to work. And now, obviously, we see that every important gallery has a really amazing website. One thing that's a carryover from that beginning um, phase in Mixed Green's life is that we still have spaces online. So that's something that makes our gallery really different than a lot of others, is that we have that sort of transparency, where people, you can actually go, you don't see it right away, but you can go in and you can actually see if something's available and have a stock. Did you say you have prices? Was that the word you used online? We do, yes. Um, is that, so that's a conscious choice to have prices there, and it's sort of interesting. I can only think of one other good gallery that I know that does that. Um, Greg Cusera in Seattle does that, I think, nicely. Um, my sense is that the art world is at the tipping point. I'm reading that more sales are happening online than in galleries. But then the articles don't substantiate that. Um, but regardless, it's it's it, there's an equilibrium of sorts. If if this trend continues, the brick and mortar thing is going to become less and less significant. 
I think brick and mortar galleries, you know, and Jerry Saltz wrote an article not that long ago, you know, about sort of the demise of the artists flocking to gallery openings and the absence of a dialogue and the absence of a critical exchange and the dilution of the amount of art criticism that is happening that is, you know, that contributes to the dialogue. Project, where is, it, where is this going to be in, let's keep it a little simple, where is this going to be in four or five years? Um, I don't know. I, I read that article, and while I strongly support the idea of putting information online and making the art world more accessible to not only artists, but collectors and people who are just interested in art, um, I wouldn't do it any other way. I, I want there to be a bricks and mortar space. I think that although the audience might be changing and we're finding a lot of our information online, you don't actually have to visit a gallery to see an exhibition. I think you still do have to visit the gallery to really see what you're looking at, really understand the texture, really understand um, the experience. A lot of art, I'd say, these days, it's about the experience, not just um, seeing something on a two-dimensional surface. So, and I still find the gallery is being this really great place for dialogue, for conversation, for um, unexpected events. And it's more really so for you guys than many galleries. More so for you and Mix Greens than many galleries, I think. I think you're a more people-oriented gallery. I don't think you necessarily look to see the person's checkbook before engaging them in a conversation. Um, you know, I think you have, you have a genuine interest, interest in art and education. So, you know, I think that makes you guys special. Yeah, I think um, a, lot of us, a lot of us teach, a lot of us do. Um, outreach and that was that was our original intention was to always although we started online it was always to do a lot of outreach and a lot of education so we were sending out um these catalogs to i don't know if you ever received one but these catalogs to thousands of people every year that was a mix of commercial um uh information about how you could buy something how much it actually costs but then also interviews with people from nonprofits and different foundations so that someone who was sort of interested in art, but intimidated by it, could learn something and then feel comfortable buying. So, I mean, it was a commercial tool, but we've always been used to the education. And, but I think there will, always, there will always have to be galleries. I think that it's really, really difficult to survive right now as a bricks and mortar space and not to be doing some of these other more alternative things. And I, I think, this, agree. yeah, for even the people who don't put their faces online, a lot more galleries are participating in ArtNet art space, artsy, all these different online entities where they can sell work without having the information on their website directly. Um, and I think that's going to continue and expand. Yeah, and unfortunately there's some predators that are, you know, coming in and posing as decent entities and aren't and are taking advantage of artists. And sometimes it's hard to tell, you know, whether it's the wolf in, in sheep's clothing. Um, so you and I both work to assist artists in advancing their careers. What, you know, like, do you see the needs of artists changing in the last 10, 12 years? I mean, I, I mean, I can, we can talk specifically, and we will, about what visual artists need to get their careers where they want to. But I'm going to start with what's the difference between where it was and where it is? Do you see a difference in artists' needs? Um, I guess I've learned a lot over the past 10 or 12 years, so I kind of understand the needs a little bit better um, now than I did back then. But I would say that back then, it, it's going to sound naive, but it seemed a little simpler. A lot of the needs that artists were coming to make streams with were um, the basics, like, um, I can't pay my rent, I'm going to need to, I, can you help me sell something? Or um, I make installation, I haven't told any, I need storage. They were, they were related to um, the nuts and bolts of just how to have a studio, how to make work, how to get that work shown, the basics. Um, now, mainly thinking in terms of brick and mortar spaces, now I feel like a lot of artists need help not only navigating that, but in addition navigating all the online, the online presence that they could have. So social media, um, marketing, because while the internet has provided, I think, really amazing opportunities for artists to do so much more on their own and to not rely on a gallery and not actually need a gallery. 
um, that's also a huge responsibility to have all these opportunities to market your work, to reach out, to have a larger audience, and deciding which ones you actually need and want as an artist. I think those are really hard and important decisions. So I think it's gotten a little bit more complex because there are so many more options to how an artist can get their work out to the public. But on the other hand, that probably served artists really well because you know, we did, I did a webinar a year or more ago with Dana Martin Davis, who's a wonderful collector, and she talked about how there isn't really an art world, but there are art villages. And right. you know, I talk about artists figuring out what village they, they are in, and then, you know, thinking about what village they want to be in, you know, so that if you have this kind of breadth, I think it increases the likelihood that someone can find the niche or the village that they're comfortable being a part of. You know, maybe mm -hmm. you can even look at, she talks about how the art world is sort of like a three-ring circus, and you, you don't necessarily have to be in the center ring to have a really nice career. So, and you know, there are lots of different ways to participate in the art world. So did, did the act of writing a book change your thinking about how artists engage? Well, it did a couple things for me. So, um when we decided to write the book, I was doing it because I was sort of at this place in experience where we were all about transparency and democratization. And but even though I had those beliefs, I I noticed myself um, becoming very brainwashed by sort of the way the art world has always worked. Um, so when I got together with my co-author Jonathan Malber, who has been my friend for a long time, he was working for Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts. He was asking me a bunch of questions um, about why certain things had happened and why artists had gotten into situations where they needed volunteer lawyers for the arts. And I was giving very um, uh, expected and sort of traditional answers as to why these things happened. Like, well, no one writes something down and everything's on a handshake and it's all relationships. That's why the person didn't have a consignment form or hadn't signed a contract or never asked a question like, when am I going to be paid? Um, and he pointed out that my answers to his questions were were very um, antithetical to my philosophies. Uh, so we decided to, to try to be even more transparent and write down all the things we know. So in the process of writing the book, I interviewed kind of the way that you do with this class, um, interviewed a hundred different art professionals, and I wanted to know how they would answer a lot of questions like about some time of forms, how they found artists, things like that. Um, and something that I figured out, which I was really surprised by, was that almost everyone answered the questions the same, even though they weren't communicating with one another. So in this, in this course, you know, the answers are, are pretty similar. Yeah. Slight different twists, but pretty much the same. It's fascinating. Right, and it was surprising. And one of the things that I was most concerned about writing the book was I had never written a book before, and I didn't know how I was going to be able to combine all this information and how I was actually going to be able to write it, um, because that was going to be really complicated. If I got 100 different opinions on one topic, how, how do you put that in a book that's not very long? But um, it ended up being far simpler than I thought, and that was disappointing <laughs> in a way. Um, now, this is... Uh, the book is now several years old, and so I think things have gotten a little bit more complex. That um, although we acknowledge really straightforwardly, I hope that everyone gets this from the book, that um, there are many different options for artists, like showing in a gallery is only one option of many. Um, the world has grown even more since then. And I'm curious if I were to update the book and re-interview those people, maybe add another 100, um, how the answers might differ. I would venture to say, as you just said, they're probably still the same. I think the art world, although we're supposed to be the avant-garde and moving at the cutting edge of whatever's happening, moves really slowly, and it's actually very tech -based. <laughs> So things have To a large extent. I mean, and I think that gives us the opportunity to play on the tech front edge of it. But I think, yeah, basically you're quite right about it. Um, <clears throat> so... I mean, I kind of feel like, you know, somebody once asked me, you know, they, or somebody said to me, Paul, my, I would be a successful artist if I could just get past the next obstacle. 
And I looked at him and I said, there are no obstacles. <laughs> and I feel like, you know, there's a certain zenness to this. I mean, I feel like to a large extent, <clears throat> the obstacles that exist are the obstacles they, we put in front of ourselves. Right. And that <clears throat> some of it's a, a lack of information, a lack of knowledge, you know, not necessarily understanding the, the how to go about getting a gallery if one wants a gallery or how to not need a gallery if one doesn't want a gallery. And maybe a lot of people don't understand that public commissions are an option that's available to them because, they, you know, they don't know anyone who's ever done it. Um, but a lot of the problem I find that artists have is inertia. You know, I mean, many. The, the, I would love to teach a course where all the artists were so successful, the course is about how to be humble. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I mean, I, that, that that's my goal. Um, but, you know, there, there, there's all this striving, and to an extent, I, I feel like people get comfortable trying to achieve, but when actually achieving is within their reach, it gets to an uncomfortable zone, and they sometimes subvert themselves. And, you know, some people have sufficient drive to push through that or go around that, that self-imposed obstacle you know, to, to, to get to that success. Are there characteristics that you can identify with the hundred or so people you've interviewed and others? What are the characteristics that you, I mean, you and I can look at an artist. We can have an artist come into our space. We can see their work or not even see their work and talk to them for 10 minutes. And we get a real sense, this person is going to make it. I'm glad I met them. And you know that may not be ten percent of the artists we encounter. That would be nice if it were. But what is it about? What is it that gives us you, particularly since I get to ask the questions? What is it that gives you that sense about an artist being on the threshold of success? Well, that's, that's an interesting question. So um, one thing I usually say when I'm doing talks in front of people is that no matter how much professional practices advice you get, no matter how many classes you take, no matter how, how many people you talk to. If you don't have dedication to your studio and you don't have confidence in the work that you're making, none of the professional practices advice is going to help you. Um, I feel like one of the things that gives me an indication as to whether the artist is going to do well and whether I, I want to really work with them is they're so confident in what they're doing. And that doesn't mean they think every single thing they're making is the best thing in the world. And in fact, that's a problem, actually. Right. Um, but they have direction, they are confident in their studio practice, they're dedicated to the studio, they're there, they're working, there will be no distractions when it comes to that. It doesn't matter if they have a day job that's 40 hours a week, they figure it out in the time that they have and they prioritize their studio above um, the day job and the other things that are distractions. Um, they also have ambition. And you can just sort of, you just get that um, immediately if you're talking to someone. It doesn't mean they make really large work. It doesn't mean they have to do like $100,000 public commission. It means they just are pushing themselves to um, as far as they can go in a way. And whether that means through setting a really great space to show the work or getting access to the right materials, or just finding the time, um, they're pushing themselves and they have this ambition. So I feel like the confidence part is huge. And I know not everyone has um, the personality that's going to go in and talk to someone and really couch um, all their positive attributes immediately. And I think that can be really obnoxious. <laughs> um, but I think you can be confident in your work without being obnoxious. How many artists does Nick Screens work with? We work with um, 18. We represent 18 artists at the moment. But um, I also do other projects too. So um, we do an in actually, I want to mention this to all of the viewers out there. Um, we take submissions actually in July. So this is very perfectly timed. And January every year. So the next submission is now. So you can send things into us now. And then we look at them in August. We um, put together group exhibitions based on the submissions that we get. Uh, and then we also have this thing called our window projects. We have windows that face 26th Street out here. 
And um, every two months we switch over who's in the window. So you just send a proposal in January and that's how we program the next year. So we represent 18 people, but then I probably work with um, about six people a year with the windows and then at least anywhere from 10 to 25, depending on how many group exhibitions they're doing, um, other people each year. How much turnover is there in those 18? I mean, <laughs> you know, not much. Strange. That's <laughs> so that's, that's, that's the tough one. Yeah, which is why we do the window installations and which is why I love doing group exhibitions. And it's also why I'm on the board of Nurture Art, which is an amazing nonprofit, if you don't know about it, in um, Bushwick and Brooklyn. They also take submissions. So they take submissions for um, group exhibition proposals and solo exhibition proposals every year. And that's how they program their schedule. What's the math? How many people submit proposals or submissions to mix greens and how many to nurture out? So um, nurture out, I'm not exactly sure. I know that um, when the jury, several hundred, I would say, for solo and much less than 100 for group. So group exhibitions have a, have a, um, a lower, because obviously a group exhibition proposal is harder to put together, so it's not surprising. There are fewer of those proposals, um, and solo it's a few hundred for approximately like eight eight slots or so. Although they do a lot of outside projects too, where they use people from the um, open call. Um, we get about two hundred, I'd say, proposals, maybe more um, each each time slot during the year. But I will say one thing to that. So out of the several hundred um, submissions we get each time. I'd say maybe even half of them haven't done their research. So you can cut out at least half of those people just um, on an initial look that doesn't take too long. So I think one of the most important things an artist can do, aside from their studio practice, of course, and getting confident in your work and getting to a point where you really want to show the work, um, is to be doing research on venues that are appropriate to your work. So places where your work has a dialogue with the other work that's been shown, being shown, about to be shown, um, a place where you really respect all the artists being shown, maybe not all of them. I don't think any program out there is 100% um, uh, liked by any other person. <laughs> There's going to always be some variation. But um, a place where you respect most of the artists, you like the context, it's the right context for your work. It's the right space for your work. You like the personality of that space. You need to do a lot of this research in advance. I get a lot of submissions where I look at it, and I look at images first, right, and all the other collateral later. You look at the images, and you're, you think, we've never shown anything like this ever before, and we never will. Like, we get um, people who will send, uh, Black and white photography, for instance, and we've or never ever shown. Horns. Sorry? Painting of the unicorns. <laughs> exactly. I mean, actually, we're more apt to show a painting of the unicorn. It's right. <laughs> hard to show um, black and white landscape photography. So just, just doing that research in advance is going to um, solve a lot of problems <laughs> for you and for us. And it won't, if you're doing the research, you're not going to waste it. Yeah, I mean, I advise people to seek out a handful of these kinds of opportunities and to research, research them thoroughly and, you know, a handful at a time. And the research, I mean, do your homework, um, you know, and it, it, it only makes sense, but the shotgun blanket, let's shoot everybody approach is sort of self-effacing. It is. It's, and it's, it's, um, it's horrible to watch because I, the reason I wrote the book and I got my MSA, I, I feel for the artists who are doing this and I, it doesn't please me to send rejection letters in any way. And I feel like I wish I had more time in the day because I would actually write to the people and say, you know, you really please in the future do more research so you're not wasting your own time. You, because for most artists, there is a place that you do fit in. There's, there is. There's so many different opportunities. As you said, the world has opened up. So there are, there are lots of different opportunities for artists out there. And you just have to figure out the place that's appropriate for you and appropriate for your work. And I think a lot of artists assume 
that showing in a gallery space is going to solve so many problems and that they need to be showing in a gallery space. Those are the people that we're getting that are submitting. Um, and in many cases, a gallery space is actually the wrong context for their work. And a different kind of space would actually be more successful. But only they can figure that out, and only an artists can decide that for themselves. I can't decide it for them. That's true. Do you have contracts with your artists? We do. Um, we do have how contracts. Gallery, how many galleries can you think of that do? I think I've got a list of about one now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do know a few that do, but no one really talks about it because it's seen as being far too formal for the gallery world. However, it is a business, and so I think it's pretty important to write these things down. So we have contracts with the artists. It does not say that they're going to have to stay with us forever and we'll stay with them forever, although that's the intention when you're signing a contract. You're hoping that the relationship is going to last um, for a long time. But we have one-year contracts that renew unless we don't want to renew them. I've never had a problem where if an artist wants to leave the screen or we think the relationship is growing in a different direction, we split up that we look at the contract and we say, oh, this is going to have to happen on October 21st because that's when we sign the contract. So it's not about a time limit, but what it is about is just laying out all the things we expect. So it's expectations, things that they should expect from us, things that we expect from them. It's very much like a consignment form. It's just more a more formal consignment form where, or a more long-term consignment form where we lay out expectations so that we are able to have a discussion on a number of different points in advance of anything that happening. Let's talk and about I, expectations. Sure. What would an artist working from you expect you to do for them? Like we'll get to the other them. side in a moment, so let's start there. Okay. So I think an artist can expect from, so you're saying like a rep representation contract? Yep. Um, from us, I think they should expect that we will give them exhibitions. Um, How often? Well? One every two, a solo exhibition, one every two years. Okay. Um, we will also sell their work. It's one of the big things the commercial gallery is supposed to do. And if we do sell them, then it's a 50-50 split. We give discounts. And we will split discounts with the artist up to 10%. If we're gonna, if we want to split a discount over 10%, we have to ask them. We, um, let's see, we take images of their work. Um, we pay for shipping to and from their studio. Thank you. So we, um, if we pay for production, which sometimes we do, that's case by case. We don't say we'll always pay for production. So if you're a photographer or sculptor and you need something fabricated or printed or mounted, um, we'll pay for that, but we, um, if we don't sell it, then the artist will owe us that money. Um, they don't have to pay it right away. It will be taken from future sales. Um, and if the relationship splits up, then the artist will owe us the money. However, we figured out other ways to deal with that where the artist has never had to write a check. Um, we pay for framing if we represent an artist, and that there's no balance sheet on that one because we can always take a drawing out of the frame or a piece out of the frame. Um, and the reason we pay for these things, by the way, was at the beginning, we didn't pay for these things because we didn't think we had the money to do it. However, we figured out that when we were representing someone and we had a long-term relationship with them, um, a lot of times the artists were cheaping out, <laughs> to, to put it bluntly, on frames of production. And so when we did sell something, a lot of times we have to have it reproduced or produced again, or we had to get it reframed for the collector. So it was actually costing us more money and time than if we had just done it from the beginning in the proper way. How many so, percentage of the gallery's artists live within 20 miles of the gallery? Um, good question. Probably over 50%. Um, but I wait. Sorry. I'm sorry. I, I was asking where are the rest, but oh, I, I, didn't to, I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh no, no, probably over over fifty percent. However, when we found a lot of them, they were not living in New York. So we purposely try to find people from outside of New York, and then it just ends up that a bunch of them have moved to New York since, and so 
we used to have artists in Chicago. We've all moved. <laughs> we used to have, we've, we do have artists in LA. We have artists in Oakland, in Oregon, Maine. Um, we had one in Texas. So we found them from all over the country. Um, and then a lot of them have moved to New York. And what, what, what is it that artists should do for the gallery? Um, make work. I mean, we obviously don't put that in the contract, but that's what's expected, is that they're making work, they're dedicated to their studio, um, they're going to try their best. Um, so I'm trying to think of what in the contract. Actually, the contract, now that you're really pointing it out to me, the contract is more what we're providing. Um, I guess the, the parts that are obvious is that they're going to let us take 50% from sales, um, things like that. Uh, but we expect... I guess, aside from the work, um, general um, participation, I guess, in the gallery program. We expect communication. We expect um, the person to be actively involved in what we're doing. So even things like a press release, like, for instance, that's, that's on my mind. So I was writing a bunch of them today. When I'm writing a press release, I do the rough draft. I send it to the artist. They can have as much or as little involvement in the process as they want but I expect some sort of active engagement for them to be available on things like that when I send it to them, timely response, professional response, um, quick follow-up. If I need something, let's say a curator comes in or a collector comes in and we need additional information from an artist, I expect quick follow-up. I expect someone to respond to my emails and my phone calls as quickly as possible, the same that you would in any job. Yeah, you expect professionalism. Professionalism, yeah. Do you – that question sort of disappeared. Um, of the galleries that live – excuse me, of the artists that live in proximity to the gallery, yes. how many of them come to a majority of the openings? Um, a bunch of them come to almost every opening. Um, we also try to do team building exercises every once in a while. So we'll have a soccer game or a bake-off or something like that to try to instill a, um, a community sort of atmosphere amongst artists in the gallery. We can't do that nearly as often as we'd like to because they're fun. But um, a lot of the artists do visit the gallery for the openings, and we greatly appreciate it. It's a, it's a nice um, feeling to have the artists supporting one another, and I think that only helps. It also helps as far as sharing of resources and sharing of skills. Um, my favorite connection sort of that I make through this job is to find an artist who, let's say, wants to make a video and needs to learn certain editing and another artist knows that and needs something else. And so sort of fostering and helping these barters and the exchange, these exchanges happen um, is a really rewarding I think, part of being in the gallery. I feel like Mixed Greens is a really, really special kind of place, and I think there are a few others in New York also, you know, like um, Joe Amron and Ed Winkleman, and we did a webinar uh, with Franklin Parrish, who's sort of different but also really wonderful. You know, um, you guys are some of my favorite people, by the way. Who is? Those are some of my favorite people, by the way. They're really great people, and, you know, there, there's an accessibility that I think is really significant and distinguishes you and hopefully augments your business. I got a last question, and then you guys, we'll go to you guys and see what questions you have. Um, aside from these two times a year that you look at proposals or submissions, do artists get on your radar? Are there artists you pursue that you go after because you've seen them somewhere or you encountered them somehow? Um, you know, are there, how, how do other artists get on your radar besides those those two ways? Sure. Um, the number one way I think artists get on my radar is through artist, artist recommendations. So the artists that we currently work with or we have worked with in the past, they tend to recommend people. And I take those recommendations very seriously because the person already has worked with us um, and I've noticed that while artists, another one of my favorite parts of the art world is when people are very generous to one another and recommend each other to different things. Um, so while artists can be very generous with the sorts of recommendations, they tend to only recommend people who they think are good fits 
so they've done sort of the research, um, and also people they really respect who they think have a dialogue with artists who already show in the gallery. So I love artist recommendations. Aside from that, I try to see as much as I can. I do go to a lot of group exhibitions, um, not only in this area, but whenever I'm traveling. So I like to get to other places in the country as often as possible. Obviously, I can't travel all the time, but I see as many group exhibitions as I can, especially in artist-run spaces um, and nonprofit spaces. I also do um, studio visits and MFA programs. However, we've never shown someone or represented someone who's still in school, because I think that's it's really important. My belief is that it's really important to grow and experiment and push yourself while you're in school. And so to have the pressure of someone else liking a certain body of work and showing that, uh, it, it makes me feel uncomfortable. So we we have not shown people who are still in school. We wait till people are out of school and we've watched them for a while. And it might also be personal since I know that I got my MFA and within a few years I figured out my true my true calling. Um, so you're sort of waiting to see if people what how well, you normally them. wait from the time you see somebody out of school before you really are interested in considering representation. Well, a lot of times maybe what we'll do is put them in a group exhibition or. Um, Maybe they'll do a window proposal or something like that so that we can actually have a, it's, it's a slow process. It's not a really quick process anyway. So it takes several years usually from the first I time. Makes, I think that makes so much more sense. The galleries that my MFA programs look for, I mean, I hated it when I would take on a young artist and invest my soul and money in them. And then their girlfriend moved to Seattle and they ran after them. And then I was selling 12 paintings a month, and then they, you know, would you like to meet the artist? Let's go to the studio. And then they disappear, and then it just goes, Wah. you know, it's sort of like it, I want it to be a team relationship. And if the other person splits, it's kind of hard to be a team. I guess the team thing was what I was trying to get at, the collaboration and that camaraderie. I mean, I'm not expecting, we're not, I'm not best friends with every single artist, but I like to have a really good relationship with all of them so we can communicate really um, easily and fully. Um, yeah, and so, and some people, you know, if you want to see that someone is on a certain trajectory and they're not really veering off. I mean, also something, once you start representing someone, my philosophy is that you sort of have to, it's a long-term thing, right? So, some good times and bad, and not every artist is going to make the best body of work every single time. Like, there are going to be mistakes. There's going to be experimentation. There's going to be all this stuff, and so you need to know that the artist is still going in the in the same in the right direction. And they want to do that. They need to look at us to do the same thing. We need to be a stable a stable place that's sort of moving in one trajectory. And I think that's really hard when you're right out of school. You have to figure out so many different things about your life. Um, it just takes a while. Agreed. You guys, anybody want to raise your hand? I can keep going, but I, you know, you guys have a right to ask some questions here. Who's got questions or comments? Joan, go ahead. And you, um, what areas do you represent artists um, geographically? And also, um, once you have an artist and you have a show every two years for them, do they are they likely to get locked into a particular type of work, or are they free to? you know, do kind of new work in two years. How, how does that change um, over the over time? Okay, good question. Um, I So I know some galleries who represent their artists globally, <laughs> and they say that they represent their artists in the whole world, which I think is a little bit ludicrous. Um, other galleries might be the country, different regions. We tend to say tri-state area. So we represent exclusively in the New York, Connecticut, New Jersey sort of region. Um, but we help the artists depending on their relationship with other galleries, other parts of the country. If someone is is offering them something for the first time and it's not in this region, it's up to them whether they want to go through us because we can sort of stuff out the situation and then in the future it can be direct with them. So anyway, so technically it's more tri-state area. Um, and then the other question was, yeah, once we give them the show over two years, we expect them to do everything the same, and no, definitely not. So um, a lot of our artists, it's very hard for me to try to figure out the 
the real common denominator that um, that connects every artist that we show right now. Um, but one thing that a lot of them do is they're is they're more conceptual and their media changes based on concept. So some of them dramatically change every two years, which is not in concept but in materials. Um, and that offers a huge challenge for us because um, maybe, let's say, the drawing show one time um, we were able to sell pretty well. Two years later, it's similar concept, obviously same artist, but it's, it's sculpture or it's video or it's something like that. Um, we expect that that's going to happen, especially in this day and age when people are using so many different media to express themselves and it's, and it's so easy to um, to change media depending on process, and we encourage it, um, but it, it's tough. We we expect it to change, and then if we if it changes so dramatically from what we first saw, and it's not working anymore, then that might be a reason that the relationship breaks up. But thus far, that that's never been the reason why the relationship stops. It's usually something else. How many how many times will you show an artist which that doesn't sell much or at all? So that's an interesting question. I feel like everyone's roster of the artists that they represent is comprised of a few different um, types of uh, artist artwork. So I see it as being this kind of wheel. I always describe it like this, and I still know if it makes any sense. But I see all our artists as being this wheel. The two on one here and one here might not actually um, be obviously related but they're all related to the artist next to them, and it creates this nice dialogue. Um, I, oh no, I was going somewhere and then I forgot the question. What was the question again? <laughs> it was about, I don't know. Oh, how many times will you show an artist with the work not selling before? Yes, you're good. So um, a lot of the artists we, I mean, all of the artists we hope to sell. I'll put that out there. And I think every commercial gallery needs that hope. Otherwise, what are they doing? You need to keep your doors open. So you hope to sell all of them. Some of them you kind of, you know you can sell. Some of them you're building an audience so that hopefully in the future you're going to be able to sell them um, better. There are some artists that you always hope to sell, but you know it's going to be very, very difficult. So why would a commercial gallery sell or show people that they know that they probably can't sell? And it's because they offer the reputation of the gallery something, or we know that there's critical attention behind them, or we know there's academic attention behind them. There's that there's something that makes the artist worth showing and letting them experiment regardless of whether they're gonna be sales. Because I feel like if we if every show we had was obviously um, done because of sales. It would be a very boring program and not a very critically interesting program. Um, instead, we, try, we, we do mix it up. And as an artist, that's something to really think about. If you're making work that a gallery is taking on not because of sales but because of something else, is that the situation you want to be in? Um, if you're, if you, I mean, there's some galleries that are essentially vanity galleries where the people who run the gallery have enough money that they don't need to make sales, they, sh they merely show artists that they love. Mm -hmm. And would you rather be with a gallery where somebody loved you but didn't have to sell your work, or would you rather be with a gallery where the dealer needed to sell your art and promote your career for them to survive? Right. An interesting question. It is, and it's a really different atmosphere. And one, you can probably experiment in a way that you couldn't experiment with the other. Um, one is much more volatile if it's, you know, um, uh, hand to mouth, sort of uh, the way that they're paying their rent, and so it's just, yeah, two very different situations, and there are pros and cons to both. Exactly. And then there's a friend of mine who has a solid career and reputation going, and has just been picked up by a major New York gallery, and all of a sudden he's saying, "Paul, this is bad. I feel so constrained. I can't experiment. If I do one show that doesn't sell out, or three quarters of it doesn't sell, I'm out the door." And that is making me replicate work I've done before as opposed to breaking new ground. And I don't know what I'm going to do. It's, that, too, is an interesting challenge. It's an incredible stress. And I think there are some people out there who wish they had that kind of stress. <laughs> you know, someone selling so much work that they have yeah, the stress. Have like, what is yeah, yeah. yeah. But, Robert, but you have a question. Go ahead. 
Robert, for yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I just wanted to know uh, how many of the artists you work with actually make a living from their art, or is it sort of all over the board? Hmm. Good question. Um, it's all over the board, actually. I'd say there's a handful, maybe a third of them, um, that make a living only from their artwork. Okay. Um, the other two thirds have different day jobs, and those day jobs are everything from farming to teaching. So, and in some cases, the day job uh, very much feeds into and um, it uh, informs the work. And so that would actually be very hard for them to do the work without the day job. Um, and others, the day job is, is simply a day job that they're doing just to make money. So. Okay. You know, sometimes, I mean, I don't know, I have really mixed feelings, and I've, I've shared with some of you before, you know, when the Vikings went out and conquered foreign soils, they burned their ships when they land on the beaches. You know, they either conquered or went back, and I think that's a hell of a way to attain success if, you know, like death is the, other, is the only other choice. Um, <laughs> on the other hand, you know, I spoke to an artist who's a college professor, and he wouldn't have been able to buy a home if he didn't have, you know, because the mortgage industry wants you to have steady income and, you know, steady documentable income um, like that. But then again, we talked to Gregory Scott last week, and he said that he's got, he's been approved for a loan for a new house, and, he, and he's totally existing off of this artwork. But, you know, some of these tangential life kinds of issues, you know, relate to that. I don't see any more hands. Who's got questions? I got another one. Nobody else has questions. I'm ask another one. Up, oh, Paula, go ahead. Of the art is that you sell. Wait, start over, Paula. It took a second. I'm sorry. Go ahead. All right. I was curious what price range the art that you sell is. Oh, okay. Um, we have artwork that's anywhere from $150 is the least expensive, um, all the way to $100. So there are certain what did There's you say? $150 to what? To $100,000. That's, so that's an enormous range, right? I, the, the average price point is more in the 5000 ish to 10000 ish range. Um, most of what we sell is uh, it's definitely an emerging artist gallery in a way. Uh, some of our artists are much more mid-career now, so the question before is how many of them um, live off their artwork alone. Um, there's that that third is probably more pushing toward mid career at this point, and there are a few artists who have very high price commission work um, that we do sell, and that makes it possible for us to show so many people who have a lower price point because we don't do any secondary market sales. So that's how a lot of other galleries that are showing emerging artists actually make money and stay in business is they're actually they're doing the secondary market sales off the back. And we Define don't secondary market for some people so, who may not know. So it means you're not working directly with an artist, you're working with a collector to resell something. Primary market's the first time the work of art is sold. Secondary is every time thereafter. Yeah. Um, what about secondary market sales of pieces by artists you work with? So this is an interesting point. So a lot of people, um, the reason they don't want to put prices on their website, they don't want to be really um, transparent about what's available, what's not available, is that they're supposedly um, saving work for very good collections, they're being very careful about who's buying so that they're not going to resell. Um, they're making sure they're placing uh, pieces in collections that are going to be donated to museums, et cetera, et cetera. And a lot of people are guarding against this resale because once you have a lot of things in um, resale or if anything goes to auction, your prices um, are potentially threatened. So um, we are very transparent about our pricing. We're very transparent about what's available and what's not available. And so far in 13 years, we've only had, I think, two um, resales so far. And I'm going to knock on something right now. but. While we're being really transparent, the people that are coming to us and buying and the people who have bought aren't doing it for investment purposes alone. They obviously like the work that they're buying. So that's a really, um, it's kind of reinforcing that if you are a little more open, it's, it's not necessarily a bad thing for the art world or the artist. 
Cool. Thank you. Um, Maria, go ahead. As you, you mentioned that certain work um, is not necessarily appropriate for a gallery. Uh, other than something obvious like public sculpture that's large scale outdoor sculpture, what what did you mean by certain work is inappropriate? Like what would you what type of work would you say is not appropriate for a gallery? Well, I think there's um, a lot of people. I think that it depends on the goal of and the audience that you want for your work. So I think there are a lot of people, I've seen um, artists recently who, for instance, make work that really should be shown in, let's say, a hospital situation or um, an outreach center or um, a school or a place where the audience is going to appreciate it on a different level than a gallery going audience. So um, I am of the mindset that you shouldn't just be showing in white wall gallery spaces um, or museum spaces and spaces that are deemed appropriate by the art world, I'm of a mindset that art should be everywhere <laughs> and that sometimes art is more appropriate in a natural history museum versus an art museum or a science museum. I just went to the math museum recently, math, M-A-T-H, uh, and there was artwork there that was extremely appropriate to that setting and much more interesting in that setting than if, and I read it differently than if I had walked into a gallery and seen that artwork. So, but there's also kind of art that, where, you know, the, the art, the gallery sells nothing under fifty thousand dollars, and your work is under ten thousand. It wouldn't be appropriate. Or a gallery only shows artists of color, and you don't qualify. Or a gallery only shows a given aesthetic. Um, you know, I don't know, right. figurative art and you make abstract paintings. You know, so this is, again, the point of doing the research and one's homework to suss out the fit. Right. Mm -hmm. But maybe your, goals, maybe your goals aren't about a white wall space with a gallery going audience. That's true. That's, sure. it's, it's, I mean, it's so much, it's so exciting sometimes. As you said, public sculpture is the most obvious to um, walk along the street and see someone who's just yarn bombed. <laughs> you know. Oops, I accidentally muted you for a second there, Heather. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> all sorry. right, I, I, let's take two more questions, and then I think we need to wrap it up. Emma, go ahead. Um, thanks, Paul. Hi, Heather. Hi. Uh, my question is: Do you show in the art? Do you show in art fairs? And um, if so, how many? And is that an important? Is that important to your artists that you do that? Yeah, so several questions in one. Okay. Uh, we do do art fairs. We do um, several a year, probably between four and five a year. It just seems like we're doing them constantly. Um, we, uh, it's really important to us as a gallery as far as sales are concerned and as far as outreach is concerned. Since we don't, something I didn't mention was that we don't show, we, we don't show artists living and working outside of the United States. We only show them in the United States. You don't have to be American, but you need to be in the United States because of our shipping and our um, budgets for travel. However, uh, and so it's really hard for us to actually forge connections with people outside of the U.S. for our collectors and curators, though, because we're not dealing with artists outside. Art fairs we find to be the best way, um, especially some of these international fairs, to meet all these people directly face to face, which is so so. Regardless of having the internet and social networking, it's really important to see these people face to face. So we do art fairs for that purpose. And I think because of that, it's also really important to our artists because that's the way that we're getting opportunities outside of the known the known entities. Mm -hmm. um, it's also a good way to reconnect with collectors and people from around the country. So we we don't have a marketing budget per se. Instead, we use anything we would put into a marketing or advertising budget into art fairs. We, we think of that as being the same. And so a lot of the artists are very excited to be part of art fairs um, for all these reasons. Other artists would rather not, just because they want the work to be shown in a, a more formal setting first, where it's actually a show um, somewhere, uh, versus showing it in an art fair and risking that it's going to disappear, that the piece will disappear without ever having been shown anywhere else. So I deal with each artist um, separately on that, and I know which ones want to be in them and which ones don't. Cool. Thank, Thank you. you. Herbert, go ahead. 
Herb, you there? Okay, I think you're not. Um, Lisa, you get the last question. Hold on. Okay, Lisa, take it away. I felt about work that digitally created in the computer. I think I missed the beginning of your question. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. How do you feel about work that's created digitally using a, a digital media technology? Mm -hmm. um, love it. So I, we don't represent anyone so far who is entirely a digital artist. However, I've been trying to incorporate more digital artists into our group exhibition. Um, we showed Emilio Gomeris, I don't know, you know he is um, in our, one of our last group exhibitions. I'm obsessed with Rhizome and um, all the different possibilities for digital technology and digital art. I think it's a place that I want to go in the future because I think it's interesting that we started as an online entity. It would be interesting to show work that was created specifically for an online space. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't, we haven't really explored it at all to its full, poten to its full potential or really in any way thus far, but that's one of my um, my goals for the future. And I'm very interested in learning more, and I'm constantly reading about how to show and actually sell digital art. Because people are just figuring it out now, and I love I love the whole the whole idea. Yeah, I was about to ask, but how do you market? You know, it's kind of the more challenging to market, correct? Right. Well, I mean, in some ways, and in other ways, it's easier because it's already online or can be online. Um, one of the galleries, if you're interested in looking at a gallery that's doing really interesting things with this, there's a gallery called Klaus von Nischigens. Have you heard of this gallery? No, oh, where is it? It's on the Lurie side in Manhattan, but they have a um, another sort of project called Klaus, I think it's called Klaus.net or KlausGallery.net, and it's an, on, it's an online um, version of their gallery, and they only show digital art in that gallery. And they also have Q&A or FAQ sort of things about how they're selling um, web-based projects and where that philosophy comes from. And so it, it's a really um, good one to check out if you're I'm interested. So Klaus, K-L-A-U-S? Yes. OK, great. Thank you. Let me ask Thank the last you. question myself. What are you thinking about? What are your long-term aspirations, Heather? I mean, you're really wonderful. When, when some museum's going to come along and go, have you thought about being a curator? Um, you know, how, where are you? What do you want to, where do you see yourself in five years? What do I want to do? That's a great question. And actually, before when you asked about artists um, and how you know if they're going to do well, I, I was going to say also that they're good at goal setting. Um, and they already have sort of their, you know, their goals, and they're flexible to change, but they have their goals sort of set for the future, and they sort of know where they're going. Um, unfortunately, I can't answer that question. And one of my one of my goals for the summer is to do a goal setting exercise with myself and try to figure out what exactly I want for the future. I do know that I always want to work with artists. I want to work directly with artists. So you just mentioned museums. It would have to be a place where um, the timeline is much shorter. I don't see myself looking for a museum because the timeline is so long, and a lot of times you're not working with an artist directly. Um, it's it's sometimes yeah, it's it's not a it's not the same relationship um, and collaboration that I enjoy working with in the gallery. One of the reasons I've been here so long is because the timeline is short enough that you can see things happen pretty quickly. You can be flexible to change. Um, so I need to be in a place that has all of those things. Wonderful. Thank you. I think you have um, a really great attitude, and I think your heart and your head are totally in the right place, and I love the transparency, and I love your dedication to artists, and we can distinguish again between gallerist and dealer, and you're a gallerist in the right sense of the word. I think it's a beautiful thing, and I'm really proud to have had you participate with us tonight, Heather. Wait, let me unmute everybody so that they can all echo this with me. Well, that was a bad pun. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Heather, thank you very, very much for joining us. Thank you, Heather. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Again, Heather. Oh, I don't like that. I love what you're doing. <laughs>